My name is Brock Rowe. I'm a 34-year-old member of the Big Stone Cree Nation. I was born in Fort St. John, BC, and I've lived off-reserve my whole life. And I'm an associate at Woodward & Company uh, Lawyers. And I'm Emily Snyder, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow uh, with the Indigenous Law Research Unit at the University of Victoria. And living here on Coast Salish territory, um, I'm a white settler uh, growing up in Ontario in the town of St. Jacobs, which is in traditional Six Nations territory. What does Indigenous feminism mean to you? When I consider Indigenous feminism, it's mostly at home and amongst friends with Emily. And that's only because those are the spaces that really have talked about, or that's where uh, ind Indigenous feminism is talked about. Um, I don't get to really talk about that uh, Indigenous feminism at work. And I, I wish I knew why, um, but I suspect that the reason that we don't talk about Indigenous feminism as much as I'd like to at work is just because the practice of law hasn't really considered that ever, right? And so law is just really a lot of building on what other people have done previously. And so you need to somehow bring that concept in to that dynamic of, of the practice of law. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that we talk about it quite a bit at home. <laughs> um, the work that I do is about Indigenous law and gender and Indigenous law and sexuality. Um, and I've been learning about and thinking about Indigenous feminism um, for some time now in that work. And um, so that comes into our conversations at home a lot while we're making supper or when something comes up in the news, for example, there was that um, story recently about skirts and ceremonies. And, you know, this can be a very um, contentious issue that can come up around um, questions around basically attire or dress um, in ceremony. And, you know, if, if that is considered sometimes... Uh, for some folks to be oppressive and something that excludes people from ceremonies, uh, in particular women um, or folks who might have other gender identities. Um, so, yeah, it comes up a lot in the everyday. And for myself, it's important to me um, to think to think about Indigenous feminism in relation to um, what I had learned initially uh, as I was kind of growing up and... Um, I suppose coming to see myself as a feminist when I was a teenager, um, and that was a very, um, very white, uh, very state-centric sort of feminism that I had learned, um, and that's troubling um, because you know then so many realities get excluded from that. There's a lot of feminist activism, a lot of feminist work, a lot of discussions about feminism in which colonial realities are not accounted for. And thinking about Indigenous feminism is extremely important for being able to then account for the ways that colonization and sexism um, and also how oppression around sexuality related to homophobia, how these are all connected. These are all forms of oppression that work together and they're violence and they harm people in very particular um, and profound ways. And so to not account for those realities when thinking about gender and feminism, you're missing a huge um, part of what's actually going on in the world. I don't think we're there yet to see, you know, a lot of people kind of consider Indigenous feminism in their everyday lives, you know, especially in their work. And so I'd like to see more of it in practice by people. Um, and at that point, I think you could take a, you know, a good survey of, of what kind of what's going on at that point and compare it maybe what it was like before. I, I grew up in a, a small resource industry town in northeastern BC, and we never really, um, I guess, were had it. We 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 didn't we didn't go to school and you know learn about what feminism was for one thing, um, what critical 
or, or have a real critical understanding of, of things in society. I think that we should be learning about at that age. <clears throat> so I left Fort St. John being like any other typical 19 year old male, um, with very different priorities in life. And so when I went through university, uh, including law school and then working in law, it was really only after I met Emily that, uh, I understood what I think feminism was. And then after her grad work and talking with people like, uh, professor Nip Val Napoleon, I only really kind of understood a concept of what indigenous feminine feminism could be. And to me, it, it kind of, it is a feminist understanding of the world, but through this understanding of also being indigenous as well, which has its own particular, um, history with dealing with people in society, right? A lot of, uh, settler colonialism kind of thinking that has to be dealt with and unpacked. So, that's what I see about Indigenous feminism, and I hope that it's critical as well in its work, right? Um, and I think in, in engaging with it, you need to make sure that, you know, you're constantly evaluating who has power and why and who's, you know, benefiting from any decisions or any of that work, right? Because then you really start to unpack if it's a, if it's a, a good idea, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, the idea that, you know, we need to be thinking about power, you know, who's in a conversation, who's out, why um, are there particular people that are missing when there is a conversation that's taking place and, and what's going on there um, if certain voices and perspectives are missing. And so for myself, when I think about Indigenous feminism, I like to think about feminisms. So I like to think about that in the plural, um, in that there are lots of different ideas and interpretations that people will have about Indigenous feminism, um, and that there is a dynamic conversation that is happening and will continue to take place um, about what it is that Indigenous feminism is, um, what it is that it has done, is doing, and can do in the future, um, so that we're living in a place where people aren't being harmed um, because of their gender, because of their sexuality, uh, because of their race or their cultural background. Um, and so these are really important conversations then about power. You know, the fact of the matter is, is we live in a society in which there is sexism uh, in settler society and in indigenous communities. Um, you know, this sexism is systemic in that it um, is really built into um, institutions and it, so, for example, law. Um, it's built into norms, so ideas about what is normal in our everyday lives. And so it gets taken up and it gets perpetuated. And homophobia and transphobia, these get taken up and they get perpetuated, um, sometimes unintentionally by a lot of people, just in the ways that racism is institutionalized, it's systemic and it gets taken up. And so the risk um, when we're engaging with law, the risk is, is that in discussions about law, in practices or in legal decisions, that sexism can get reinforced through law, that it can be perpetuated rather than challenged. But the, the catch is that you can also use law to challenge these problems. Uh, but we need to be able to have conversations about power and we need to be able to ask critical questions. We need to be able to ask those questions about who's in, who's, who's out, who's in this conversation um, and why, so that these problems aren't being perpetuated. Yeah, like the comment I made earlier about how law and the practice of law is really building on what other people have already done. Like that's, you know, the concept of stare decisis, um, where, you know, the courts rely on common law, which is previous decisions made by judges uh, to make a, a decision about a new set of facts that are similar to the old set of facts, right? That's the basic premise of, of the practice of law in a very simple sense. And so what Emily was saying about how law is used to perpetuate these systemic racism you know, sexism, that's how it's done, right? And so when you become a new lawyer into practice, especially, uh, you don't know what you're doing. 
um, you're in a very vulnerable state as a new articling student or a junior associate. And so you don't want to rock the boat. And so you just um, more or less accept what, you know, your, your teachers, your partners at the law firm or senior associates are doing. And if they're doing a good job and they're still doing it, you assume that's a good job, right? So you don't get to, you know, inject into that process um, a critical set of, I don't know, critical work, at least in terms of Indigenous feminism, which I would like to see more. Um, and on top of that, too, the existing way that law is practiced, it's because the practice of law, at least through private law firms, is all done, you know, according to the billable hour, right? Any more time that you put onto a file for a client uh, typically means that you're you're billing more. Uh, and so if you need to do something new that is not understood by anybody in that process, then you're taking more time to do that, which means that you charge the client more to do. So that's you know a problem because if you want to try something new where you go out and maybe engage with the community more, talk with women, talk with you know counsel uh, in a First Nations context, um, or with uh, you know the the men essentially anybody and to unpack a lot of what's going on out there in terms of indigenous feminism that's going to add up to a lot of time and expense which firms would then try and bill for right so you know it's it's difficult to figure out how to how to consider this in in my line of work um and i imagine the same is too with with i guess just feminism you know on its own as well right Mm -hmm. yeah i mean there's definitely the reality that exists with state law, absolutely, and also um, within Indigenous legal contexts where men are very much um, situated uh, in positions of power and situated in a way where um, they're treated as the the center. Um, so their social position becomes normalized, it be, it's seen as normal, and because it's seen as normal, it can kind of then become invisible. Um, so then you don't see, right, when when you're looking and you're talking about Indigenous law, let's say it's a bunch of men talking, um, if it seems so normal that it would be men talking about Indigenous law, then you don't account for how it's all men and that there aren't women there. Um, so it's really important to um, destabilize that or, or, you know, to ask questions again about where women are so that that isn't normalized. So that when you go into work, you don't have to like do all this extra work to ask to include women or to include other folks of varying gender identities in the work, right? It, the assumption that you would talk to men is... Um, troubling and needs to <laughs> be engaged with more. Mm-hmm. I guess one of the things for me when I think about indigenous feminism, because I'm a white settler, I don't, you know, I don't call myself an indigenous feminist. Um, that would be problematic. Um, but so for sure, indigenous feminism for many people um, who are indigenous, that is a way to. Um, express and engage with their own identity Um, and that's important Um, but in thinking about indigenous feminism I also wonder about um, how it can be used as a framework or um, a, a theoretical tool and a practical tool for people who aren't indigenous to think about colonization and patriarchy in relation to one another and to reflect on their own identity, not in a way where they would call themselves an indigenous feminist, um, but that it is something that people from various social locations and places in their lives could engage with. Um, and that for myself, um, it's really useful for thinking about questions related to power and to asking tough questions and um, often uncomfortable questions, but 
that it's a very powerful tool for encouraging questions about the world that we live in and how we engage in it um, when we think about our own gender, our own ability, age, um, class, sexuality, race, all of that, to think about how we engage with others and the world that we live in. It's not that I they can't talk about this stuff at work, I think. It's just, like, I can bring it up. And especially when, um, and I, I, I don't think I've come across this, at least in such an explicit sense, where um, something I'm doing I, that I've seen will just, you know, negatively impact women specifically. Um, that's like in an express sense, but implicitly maybe, and I just haven't seen it just because of the work that I've been doing. Um, yeah, so, and, and the firm that I'm at, um, they would be open to these discussions, um, more so than other law firms, like, and, and especially the larger private law firms. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't want to say that, you know, there, there aren't lawyers out there that do want to consider this and take up this work. Um, it's just a matter of timing and having the right people on the right file at the right time with the right client that you can, I think, engage in this stuff a little bit more. But that rarely happens. Like that's, that's really, uh, I think, the issue. Can you talk about some of the ways Aboriginal law and Indigenous law relate or differ? Yeah, so the work that I do, in, I'm more of a solicitor. I don't really go to court or I don't appear in regulatory tribunals or hearings and argue law or make an argument based on or using authority that have been that has been set down by previous judges or previous regulatory tribunals, right? And so that is like the common law and the concept of stare decisis, right? That Latin term where you you make law based on what a previous decision maker has done for a similar fact pattern, right? That to me, um, you know, is, is a big part of the basis of Aboriginal law in terms of you're dealing with applying that kind of analytical framework to a situation uh, when dealing with the state, and that could be the federal crown or the provincial crown, it usually is, right? Or territorial government. And so um, that body of law that we all know today as, you know, Aboriginal rights law, right? Uh, born out of issues of hunting, fishing, trapping, and whether or not the people have the right to actually do those things, whether an Aboriginal or a treaty right, and the state imposing their laws on top of, you know, what these Indigenous people are doing out on the land. That to me is like the body of Aboriginal law, right? The concept of Indigenous law to me is different in that when you talk about Indigenous, an Indigenous people, let's call it, you know, either the Cree of Northern Alberta, or it could be a specific Cree community or set of communities, however they organize themselves and see themselves, they would have their own uh, indigenous legal orders or legal ways of, you know, dealing with, with their own issues that arise or issues that arise with other peoples, indigenous or not, right? Which I see as separate from the concept of Aboriginal law. And you know, that work is important and it's, I don't want to say it's forgotten. Um, I think a lot of indigenous law still exists in a lot of different nations today. I just don't think people see it as that right now, right? And I think a large part of it is because society, Canadian society has been kind of, um, perpetuating this concept of law as being statute law, which is, you know, black letter law, you know, laws and regulations from the legislature or parliament, uh, or law that's handed down by the courts, right, through the common law. And so we kind of think in our head that, you know, these two things that create law is law. And we don't necessarily see that in our communities, I think. And so people say, oh, well, we don't really have that, so maybe we don't have Indigenous law, right? And then there's people that say, oh, no, no, we have our own law. We've, we've always had Indigenous law, right? And so they're always on an exercise of trying to validate their law as being 
you know, either the same or its own concept, separate and apart from, you know, state law or dealing with the state, which is Aboriginal law, right? So in those two kind of distinctions, the work that I do, which is largely on the Aboriginal law side, right? Even though it's solicitor's work, it's transaction work. So when I create or I'm a part of deals with First Nations, um, which involve either, you know, an economic development venture, like uh, First Nation wants to set up a, a hotel or tourism services company, or a fishing company, or a um, logging company, or just any type of enterprise. I'm dealing with federal, provincial laws, municipal bylaws, things like that, right? So that's all like kind of in that realm. The indigenous law side, I'd like to bring into that, and I don't know really how to do that without getting a chance to go out and talk with the client in a much more in-depth basis, like how I mentioned before, right? Which costs more time and money. Um, and it's really unfortunate because I, I, I'd like to go do that work for free, to be honest. Uh, it's just, I think my employers wouldn't like that. So, um, but, you know. You've got that on tape now. Yeah, no, go do work uh, they'll love free. seeing that. <laughs> but, um, you know, like, if I could engage with that work and, and figure out how, um, that would be really exciting, you know. I've seen some First Nations. Uh, they've they've you know they've they've engaged in this exercise where they want to create like a like a vision for their community or some type of vision statement or some type of like goal that they want to have to see themselves right. And so they'll consult with their community in some fashion or another, however they do it, and they'll kind of come up with this big statement and then they'll they'll try to um you know think of ways that they can achieve that in different processes with their community right and they might they might come up with different principles that they can use as like a tool to achieve that goal or vision which i think is quite exciting and i think it's more exciting when they use it uh, do that in their own language which is great um and it's also translated in English because there's a lot of young people that won't understand it. Uh, but it, you know, in, in that type of work, you know, I see more of an indigenous law component in doing that. And then what I hope is that while they're doing that work, it's critical, right? So it's taking into account women, um, elderly, uh, people that are disabled, you know, the people that are typically without power uh, in communities, youth, children, yeah. Uh, and people in the future, right, that aren't around yet, and and honoring people who have come before, right. So that's that's what I'd like to really see. And then, so indigenous feminism, I would really like to see in that process, right. And so when it be it would be just perfect if if a community was already in tune with this, and then I was asked to help them, you know, deal with something on the Aboriginal law side or the state side. I could use that body of law from the indigenous law side and go to the state side and say, here's why we're going to deal with it this way, or here's how we ought to deal with it this way. And then, you know, and then maybe a dialogue or something can take place where the community, you know, has some type of, you know, authority, you know, to rely on to say, no, we want to do it this way. Right. So I think that's, that's where I'd like to see the work. And that's how I see that distinction between the two. How are gender, sexuality, and Indigenous law related? So I guess there are a couple of things that I'm thinking of with that. Uh, one of the things is to treat gender and sexuality as complex. Um, and so what I mean by that is um, to try and ensure um, that when gender is being talked about that um, all the different ways that people might engage with gender, the, the ways that people might imagine their own gender um, and their own gender identities. All those complicated ways um, need to be accounted for. So we cannot and should not assume that gender identity means the same thing to people across the board, but that is how gender gets talked about most often. That's how sexuality gets talked about most often. And so you lose the complexities of people's experiences. Um, and when you get into conversations about Indigenous law or state law where men's experiences remain centered, um, in particular 
you know, heterosexual, male, um, centric sort of experiences, you lose all of the other experiences that happen and, and people get excluded as a result. So um, in terms of my own position as someone who teaches um, and does research in relation to Indigenous law and also state law, um, it needs to be an active um, process of always challenging oneself to um, think about complexity and to think about all of the folks out there in the world with all of their complexities who need to be included in conversations and to make space for that and to try to avoid generalizations um, and to work with the actual difficulties of people's everyday lives. In terms of legal education, um, Legal education, be it in law schools or legal studies departments, should absolutely, in my opinion, they should be feminist, they should be Indigenous-centered and oriented. And what I mean by that in terms of centering experience is that you bring it into something that is necessarily part of the conversation, always. So you don't have conversations about law and then afterwards say, oh wait, what about Indigenous people? Or you don't have a conversation and then about gender, for example, and at the end say, oh, you know, we forgot to include, um, you know, this person or this group. Like, you bring people in from the start. So um, part of the problems in discussions about both state law, and this can also happen in discussions about Indigenous laws, is that women, um, people who identify as um, gay, lesbian, two-spirit, trans, um, intersexed, folks can get tagged on at the end, um, rather than fundamentally um, redoing the conversation, rather than fundamentally altering how it is that law is thought about and how people are thought about in relation to one another. Um, so in my own teaching on law, I like to think about law as plural. And you have to start from a point then where you're including both state laws and indigenous laws. and the concept of intersectionality is really important. So thinking not only about race in relation to law, but also how gender and race intersect with one another and how sexuality intersects also and class. And so all of these shape people's experiences and need to be accounted for. Yeah. It reminds me of like what you just said about how the issue of like trans, queer, you know, two spirit, lesbian gay people is always dealt with on like one or two components of a larger course essentially in law school that's how law schools typically well the one that i went to um and in the courses that i had that's how they'll deal with aboriginal law right using the same concept i had before is you'll have you know especially in constitutional law which every first year law student has to take and you kind of go through those sections of the constitution on a day by day basis. And then you'll get to section 35 of part two, which is, you know, the Aboriginal rights of the, you know, Indian Inuit Métis peoples of Canada. And the, the class will be like one or two days on it. And then it'll kind of go, you know, and, you know, in my mind and with my ex experience, it wasn't exactly a fulsome discussion. It was actually very quick. And it wasn't even that critical or unpacked as other sections were, especially when they focus on the charter, which is kind of odd because it's a lot of the big charter cases in criminal law focus on indigenous people that have been charged in, under the criminal code, right? So, yeah, it's just, yeah, like, so in so like, in law school's work, like, they have to, they have to, I think, devote more to that, but they also have to engage way more with what Emily was talking about with, like, Indigenous feminism, and also with dealing with people who are, you know, lesbian, gay, uh, queer, trans, two-spirit, however they identify, because yeah. they're nowhere in the conversation, or Our very peripheral. remote. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's yeah. definitely, there's kind of two big problems that happen. People are either erased, um, or, you know, really heavily um, put on the margins in conversations, or there can also be a tendency when people are brought into conversations to have that be done in a way where that complexity gets lost. So women get included only or primarily as mothers. When, you know, for Indigenous women, 
and other women who aren't indigenous, motherhood is of course and can be very important, um, but it's not the only experience that people have. So there can be this tendency um, for um, folks who are on the periphery to then get included in ways that get oversimplified or, or are simplified and you know that that also doesn't help that doesn't help the conversation um, if you know the actual messiness of people's lives is missing um, and so with what you were saying about the classes where aboriginal law or indigenous legal issues get dealt with at the end i mean the fundamental question then would be is what would that look like if it was there from the start and what would it look like then in those conversations if gender and ability and sexuality and class privilege were being accounted for, um, actually really seriously and truly being accounted for? Um, so, you know, I probably already said this, but these things, they matter in everyone's lives in various ways, either in ways that privilege people or in ways that disadvantage people. But these things are happening all the time. They're happening in our homes, they're happening in workplaces, they're happening um, in the ways that people deal with law, be it state law or indigenous law. And so they have to be accounted for. We, we can't pretend like these things don't exist um, because there are serious consequences when that happens. I mean, I think with anything, <laughs> there's the risk of romanticizing. Um, definitely this can come up in relation to gender and sexuality quite a bit. Um, so for example, with gender, um, which I don't mean to disconnect that from sexuality, they're intimately connected. Uh, but there are, are a lot of pretty extreme stereotypes that exist where, you know, if you say, okay, let's talk about Indigenous law and gender, um, some people might have this reaction right away where people think, oh, okay, well, Indigenous societies are necessarily sexist and Indigenous men are necessarily violent. And that comes from really racist ideas about Indigenous peoples um, as savage and all of those really troubling um, narratives that exist about Indigenous peoples. So there's kind of that one extreme stereotype that indigenous laws are necessarily violent towards women. And then on the other kind of end, there's the other extreme stereotype, which is really romanticized, where indigenous um, gender relations are treated as though they're entirely perfect and entirely balanced, and as though they're working for everyone all the time, which can't possibly be true, because that's just, you know, we all live together in any society, and it can't possibly work for everyone all the time. People have different um, experiences and wants and desires in their lives. And so it's important then to work between those um, extremes to be able to get into the messiness of um, how it is that gender and sexuality impact people in their everyday lives and in their engagement and interactions with law, and to ask questions about the ways that um, Stereotypes can be perpetuated through law, but also challenged. Um, and I think that certainly there are increasing conversations about that. And I think that if, um, you know, I think that engagement with Indigenous feminism, for example, thinking about it as a tool or as a framework, in addition to related to identity, that can open up those conversations. It can open up space to ask uncomfortable um, questions about power.